Hello. Where are you from? Region, obviously. How old are you? Profession? And then we can get started. Uh, my name is Nicholas. I'm from Tbilisi. Half Let's from. Let's start over. <laughs> Close the window. Good Sorry, no, we just... It's okay. Again, tell us about yourself, your name, where you're from. Uh, my name is Nicholas. I'm local. I'm from Tbilisi, half from Tbilisi, half from Batumi. I'm 26. Uh, just turned recently, so I'm still getting used to... Uh... Ah, right, one more year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, currently a video editor, uh, sort of filmmaker, sort of game developer. I kind of try to do many different things. And uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Pleasure having you. Thank um, you, thank you. Topic is to, again, get us as much information as possible about Georgia. You've been following the news, you've been very active in posting and in informing people about Georgia. And this is the aim of having this interview with you. Now, when you're looking at the news, when you're looking at Ukraine, I want you to guide us through how do you feel as a Georgian citizen towards what is happening in Ukraine? Well, it's inherently a topic that's close to us because this is on a smaller scale something that happened to us in 2008. So it's military forces coming in saying, oh, these two regions are maybe going to be independent now. So we're going to put some armies there and yeah, it's, it's all good or whatever. And like mm -hmm. under the pretense of liberation it, it occupies a country so when we see something happening to a people that has happened before to us mm -hmm. it it hits home because it kind of it's you look at them and you see yourself in what they're going through except it's so much worse mm -hmm. because for us it was five days and not even on not even close to the scale that this is going on okay. and I mean Ukraine as a people have been, are notorious for being screwed over by Russia just across millennia. So it, it's, there's like a cousin-like connection, I feel. Um, do you feel threatened for Georgian safety? National absolutely. Security? Absolutely on a daily basis because you never know when Mr. M Mr. Conflict, yeah. Mr. Uh, liberation mission is gonna just decide that oh you know what while i'm there i might as well grab this small little piece of land that's been pestering me for so long and you know it's 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 scary because you don't you don't feel safe you have no guarantees that the same won't happen to you and you just it's it's a constant uncertainty and like mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. hard to sleep do you think if Ukraine and potentially Georgia fall, would that spell disaster in Europe? Would that lead to a full-scale war? Where do you see that heading as a Georgian? Honestly, if this happened 40 years ago, in, in the age where everything wasn't as easily accessible information-wise, probably not. But with how humanity has evolved since the Soviet Union collapsed. It's, you can't just hide, hide shit. It, it, that's just not how it works. So if, if the two of us fall, then, well, the rest of the world let us fall because we can't effectively, like Ukrainians have a, turns out, pretty good military and Putin is throwing cannon fodder, but that's a different, uh, I digress. But if, if they take us, then what's stopping them from pushing further and further in? Because the, one of the bigger reasons of conquering Ukraine isn't just to push NATO back, but there's an entire section of mountains that basically puts all of Europe in a bottleneck because all of their armies are going to have to go through this small area. And, and all of Russia is a plain, mostly. Mm -hmm. Like the whole western side is a big plain that you can't fight on you can't defend on so it's it's a strategic move that if they take ukraine they take us they're just one step closer to reunifying the soviet union which at this point probably means unifying the world okay now um, you seem very adamant to be in 
stands and in defense of Ukraine. Uh, one of the, sh let's say, shocking turn of events was obviously the Georgian government's response to the whole Ukrainian situation. How do you feel about it? I feel very ashamed because when you see a people that it's that are supposed to be your, uh, let's say, comrades in misery, because you go through the same kind of, I don't know how to put it, the, the same trials and tri tribulations, basically. Uh, the expectation for us as a people is to, you know, we have the common enemy. And even if we didn't have that common enemy right now, we still have like a relationship. We're still cool with each other. So when the government just speaks out on a level where it would have been better if they kept their mouth shut, it, it's, it's just, it's fucked, you know, you just, every time someone from the higher ups opens their mouth, it just, it, it gets worse. Okay. And some people have speculated that, you know, this is in terms to maintain or salvage any type of Georgian Russian political relationship, Georgian Russian uh, agreements. Do you feel like, is it important to maintain those or there's no point? Complete cutoff is never good for from anything because sure Russia and Russian people right now aren't in the best standing with us, but that doesn't eliminate the fact that we still have relatives there and friends and people we know and people we care about. So we still need to have some sort of, let's say neutrality, but it's, I don't know. You, sorry, lost my train of thought. Uh, what was the question again? The question was like, how important is it to maintain Georgian-Russian political relationships? Right. Well, there needs to be a baseline, but a political relationship should not be us bowing down to an aggressor. It should be cooperation instead of saying what they want us to say so they don't get angry. Like not poking the bear, Putin's bear. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, you mentioned earlier that, okay, two breakaway uh, nations, uh, 2008, and now, obviously, looking at the scenarios, there's a lot of similarities. You cannot deny it between the Ukrainian situation and the Georgian situation. Now, I want you to walk us through 2008 very briefly. Now, in 2008, we have very blurry information. Some sources say that Georgia instigate, instigated the war. They started aggressing on Russian areas. Russians started... Tell us, walk us through it. What happened during 2008? Well, I was 12 in 2008. And when it happened, just one morning I walk out. I'm in Batumi and my dad just goes, they're bombing Gori. He didn't even have to say who because who else would it be? So f for me as someone who went through that at the time... It was just, they're invading us. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. I don't know when it will end. I don't know if it will end. Fortunately, it did when it did. But there's a lot of misinformation about the five-day war because at the time, the states were busy in the Middle East. So since that was taking the center stage on like the international news media, Russia taking a small bite, bite out of a country that most people haven't even heard of wasn't in it just news in any capacity. So it, it, it's, it's a military strategy that has been repeated time and time again with us because you annex a region, then you say that you are the only country apart from someone in the oceanics. I don't know why they're even like involved in this, but... You annex a region, then you say that, oh, we are peacekeepers and we have to place our military force there in order for not to spark conflict. And then they spark conflict and blame it on the other party because we don't benefit anything from a military conflict. We just want to like be. Okay. Now, um, so do you think that 
it is the same situation in what happened in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, in Georgia and Abkhazia and Samad Chablo. Is it very similar to what is happening in the Donbass disconnect? What is happening right now there? Is it different? It's similar in terms of the steps that are being taken, but the reasoning for those steps is not the same. Because, because of the recent discoveries, no, and by recent, I mean like 2013, I think, of pretty big oil and natural gas reserves in Ukraine, that's what sparked the whole Crimea thing because Crimea's area on the map overlaps with a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. Russia is oil, Russia is gas, most of Europe is dependent on Russia and that would, Ukraine suddenly becoming like a play, big player in the game would result in Russia losing a lot of its income, so on and so forth. So there is a lot, Ukraine's potential is a lot more threatening to Russia than ours. Okay, okay. Now, let's move more into Georgia. I want you to tell me, is there, what is this influence of Russia, Russian politics on the Georgian government, on Georgian democracy? Is it felt? Is it apparent? Is it something that is corrupting Georgia? I think the fact that every year the government gives us a reason to go out 100 meters from here and just stand in the street in the cold, in the warm rain, snow, doesn't matter. Just because if they give, give us a reason every year, that means they're not doing something the way they should. Mm -hmm. there, there's always this sensation that instead of working for the people, with the people, they're working with Russia against the people. And that it's never going to end well because at, at, at a certain point there, we will hit the tipping point and just something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. A rather controversial figure in Georgian politics, uh, Saakashvili. Um, he is a very polarizing figure in Georgia, uh, known for contributing a lot to Georgia and known as someone who developed quite a notorious reputation with the young. I want you to tell me what is your stance on him and as he is also involved in Ukrainian politics do you feel like there's anything to be said from his experience my standing on Misha is very neutral because he did a lot of fucked up shit but he also did a lot of things that clearly benefited the country in some in more ways than others but I think right now he's just trying to be a martyr and not having enough reach or influence or goodwill, first of all, to be said martyr. I'm not very educated on just his, his reign, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, he, he, he's, he's not where he's, he should be right now. And he should not have said many of the things that he's been saying. Now, you know, the current buzzword, the current discussion is around whether should Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, join the EU, join NATO. I want us to go through that together. Now, do you consider Georgia as a European country, one that can join the EU? Yes or no? I don't think that's a yes or no question because we have always been the threshold between Europe and Asia. And I think it's fair to say that we are in equal parts, both and neither, because we're smack dab in the middle and we take enough from both sides of the planet where, or the continent where we can be considered part of both and influenced by both. But I still feel that we, are kind of going towards more the European side of things. And same with, I mean, in Ukraine is a, just, it's, it's Eastern Europe. You can't just get away with that. Same with Moldova. And joining with NATO or EU would 
be cause for a lot of change within the country because you need to like evolve and step over certain uh, prideful aspects that people may have to kind of compromise and play by their own by the terms of the alliance but that also means security against you know who that means easier just an easier way for the people to develop to educate themselves to see more of the world and just be more united with everyone else mm -hmm. now what about nato the eu makes sense okay to develop and help georgia prosper as a country what about nato nato would i suppose be a way to make our position our geographical position against russia a big instead of a bite it would be a fang that you can't get close to so that we 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 are here and there's people who are on our side and you can't just come in here take whatever you want and leave a very interesting angle is that you know having a nato country bordering Russia has been seen by some analysts as something that would be heavily against Russia, something that would heavily hinder its influence in the region. Is it something that Georgians can afford to go through being on constant like opposition against Russia? Well, ideally we would have a peaceful situation, but it's better to be defended defended from the aggressor than to sit there and let them take whatever they want because i mean they're pushing down the border every week bit by bit so at a certain point you got to push back somehow i understand now what is the biggest obstacle do you think in letting georgia join the eu what would be the biggest obstacle well russia first of all because they certainly wouldn't want us to be finally become an enemy because someone you're bullying is not your enemy but when they stand up to you then then there's competition then that you become nemesis says i guess and then there's a fight it's no longer uneven uh, but a lot of things a lot of hindrances would come from within the country as well because of how a lot of people like to think and approach things and tackle or avoid problems those mindsets would need to be molded and guided into where the passion that they take to protest against things that they don't like that they should not be protesting about mm -hmm. like lgbt issues and racism and just the tolerance and aspect in general if you take the passion they have towards protesting these things and guide it into a place where it benefits the country instead of taking away from it i think that's when we'll be able to kind of join the rest of civilized europe mm -hmm. uh, you kind of went over the last question that i wanted to address is what does this spell for the future of georgia change spells a lot of change it spells a lot of things that we need to address in how we kind of think about things and look at things and how we just approach thinking about people and loving people and I know inherently we are not an aggressive nation because Uh, it's basically in the bible for us that a guest is a gift from god it, they need to be treated as such but when your guest is instead of sharing in what you have when the guest is taking then that's we don't tolerate taking like that we we tolerate giving but we're not giving russia anything do you feel like um you mentioned that every year there there's something you're unhappy about and the government is essentially um, perhaps a puppet but at least um, unfortunately very um, unfunctional 
podcast. Do you feel like there's anything different with uh, the current protests that are going on? Do you feel like the Georgian mentality has changed in any way? Not... It hasn't changed, but as I said before, it's been guided into a place where it doesn't matter who is protesting because everybody knows what they're here for. The thing that worries me the most is that we tend to start protesting and then we protest for a bit and then the government either apologizes or it doesn't. And at, at a certain point we get bored and we disperse and we don't push the envelope as far as it should for change to happen. I don't know, every time I say that I have a good feeling about this one, but it never turns out true. I do have a good feeling about this one as well, but I don't know, I guess the only way to ensure is to keep going out and keep showing our, uh, vocalizing our opinion on what we are supposed to be doing as a people, as a nation, and as a government. And I mean, the last time we protested, they started renovating the square under the pretext that, oh, we have to renovate, it's old, but uh, no, they just wanted to disperse the crowd and they locked it down for like a year because then COVID happened and they couldn't do a fucking thing. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Nika. Cool. I'm very happy we had this brief conversation because... Fun space, you know.